Hi guys, we're going to be talking about the next era in Texas history. So this is going to cover the years 1866 to 1900. So we have a 34 year span that we are talking about. Um, a little housekeeping before we get started. You are going to need to take notes over this video. So go get your notebook, pen, pencil, highlighter, whatever it is you need to successfully take notes. So give me a quick pause, gather up your materials, and when you're ready, come back, click play, and we will get started. Okay, welcome back. So we are going to be talking about the cotton industry, the cattle industry, the development of railroads, and the Indian Wars. So let's kind of talk about the importance of this era before we really get into each category. Um, so this is going to be the era that's really going to give Texas its identity, this belief that, you know, we're proud and we can do things on our own, um, cowboy, rodeo, everything's bigger in Texas. This is really the era that's going to solidify that identity for our state. Um, so it's really an important time period. I think it's probably one of the more interesting time periods in Texas history. So let's kind of dig into that and see what about this era really made Texas into what it is today. So if you look at the pictures on this slide, we obviously have the railroad, Texas and Pacific. Right here you have Quanah Parker, who we're going to get into, but he was the last Comanche chief. We have the Buffalo Soldiers, and the Buffalo Soldiers were black soldiers in the Federal Army following the Civil War. And most of these were free blacks. Then down at the bottom, we have a cattle drive picture on the left. Cattle drives, this is going to be huge in Texas. In the middle, we have what are called sharecroppers. So the institution of slavery may be over, but the black community is still going to have a long way to go in terms of fair treatment and equability and things like that. And then in the last picture in the bottom right corner is Governor James Hogg. And we're going to talk about his role, especially in terms of the railroad and really shaping the Texas economy. So let's get into it. All right, so our learning objective in this unit is we will be studying the conflict brought about by westward expansion or a manifest destiny in Texas, the development of the cattle industry in Texas, the expansion of railroads, and then the changes in the agricultural industry and what was their impact on the political, economic, geography, and social aspects of the state. So by the end of this video, this is hopefully what you will be able to walk away understanding. All right, so we have the growth of cotton. So the Civil War is over, and the Civil War started for a lot of reasons, but the two reasons that you need to know now, and if you know these going to eighth grade, you are ahead of the game. The two main causes of the Civil War are going to be states' rights and slavery. Um, so, like I said, you're going to learn a lot more of that in eighth grade, but you need to know those two things. Um, so, if you look at the map on the left-hand side, this is the cotton belt. So, where it's really dark red, this is where cotton was predominantly grown. If you notice, it's in the South. It's in the Confederacy. So, this is where slavery was predominant and this is the entire industry that pretty much led to the civil war so you have the lighter pink so cotton was still relevant there but not as heavy as it is in some of these other locations um so the cotton industry in texas before the civil war was really well established just about 1852 is where it became entrenched in the texas culture so Texas ranked in the top 10 in the United States in terms of its cotton production. However, during the war, 
production is going to decrease. Now, here is where things get interesting for Texas. Texas didn't feel the negative effects as far as destruction of its land and towns as the rest of the South did. You know, there were only a few battles here. You had Red River, Sabine Pass, and then Palmito Ranch, which as you all learned was a month after the war ended. Um, so you really didn't have a lot of battles going on in Texas, which is going to allow Texas to maintain its cotton fields and become extremely important in the development and expansion of the cotton industry after the Civil War. And Texas is really going to rev up its production and is going to become the big state, like the big hitter, the big seller in terms of cotton. So um, the 1870s, you're gonna have the introduction of barbed wire, which we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. And then you're gonna have railroads. So it's gonna be easy for Texas to get its cotton up to the north. It's going to continue experience growth after the Civil War. And we no longer have slaves because the North won the Civil War, um, you know, which is a good thing because slavery is horrible and we need to get rid of it. So this does not mean that the day after the war ended, slaves were all of a sudden, you know, going to be free and they were going to be equal. This didn't happen. So what's gonna end up happening with most of the free slaves and even poor whites is they're gonna have to become tenant farmers or sharecroppers in order to meet the demand of cotton consumers. So let's talk about what tenant farmers and sharecroppers really are. So tenant farmers, they are farmers who rented land on which to grow crops. So they would rent, you know, five, 10 acres from the, what were one time plantation owners, they're going to rent this land and pay a certain fee every year, and they're gonna be able to grow their crops. Then on the flip side, you had sharecropping. So these were farmers who rented land, tools, seeds, and our houses, and promised part of their crop as payment. So if you grew, let's say, I'm not a farmer, so, but let's say you grew 500 pounds of cotton, then you would have to pay the plantation owner or main farmer 300 pounds of that cotton. You would get to keep the remaining 200 pounds. So that's how sharecropping and tenant farming worked. So slavery does not exist but tenant farming and sharecropping, let's be honest, it's not that really far from slavery in itself. All right, so now we're gonna have the rise of cattle. So cattle became king in Texas following the Civil War. So why was Texas set up to get all the cattle to become the epicenter of the cattle industry in America. Well, cattle were brought to the Americas by the Spaniards. Um, you had Coronado, who you learned about at the beginning of the school year, who went up into the Texas Panhandle, exploring all the west and northwest areas of Texas. As he traveled through Texas, he left heads of cattle on either sides of riverbanks. Well, over years, these cattle just roamed freely because this wasn't really a populated area. This was considered the frontier. Um, and the cattle all roamed freely and they were able to mix with one another. And eventually you got millions of heads of cattle. So, you know, you leave cattle unchecked, they're going to breed. And that's kind of what happened, basically going from the Rio Grande up into the upper panhandle. So West Texas was heavily dominated by a cattle population. So cattle's going to become the king industry in Texas. So following the end of the Civil War, the price of cattle is going to skyrocket. This is going to attract ranchers and businessmen 
to come to Texas and to try making their fortune with cattle. This is going to lead to the cattle boom. So long cattle drives are going to begin because these ranchers and businessmen need to find a way to get their cattle from West Texas to New York and Boston and Philadelphia. So the way that they determined to do that was to take the cattle onto long trail or on the long trail drives, sorry about that, on the long trail drives up into Kansas, Colorado, and Missouri, because this is where the railroads were. Texas wasn't really transportation savvy at this time period in terms of railroads. So the cattle would have to go on these thousand mile trails almost, 800, thousand miles. From Houston to Chicago, it's a thousand miles. Um, so they would have to go on these trails to get to the trains so they can then be transported to the markets to be sold further up north. This is where you're going to get the famous trails like the Chisholm Trail and the Goodnight Loving Trail. Um, ranchers in the south are going to work with vaqueros, which is Spanish for cowboys. Sorry I butchered that. My Spanish is not great, but... Um, so these were basically Mexican cowboys. And this is where Texas is really going to get the identity of being a cowboy state. Um, so these cattle drives and the vaqueros. Now, if you look at the pictures, up on the left, that is a cattle drive. You, you had a handful of cowboys and they were moving thousands of cattle up north. And then if you have the picture on the right, if you look on the cow, there's a brand on his stomach. It says DT. Well, this is how the different ranches would identify their cattle. The cattle were still able to roam freely as barbed wire wasn't in existence yet. So we aren't roping off our certain land areas. So the ranches just kind of all mixed together. So did their cattle. And they used the brand to determine who owned what cattle? All right, so this whole cattle boom and the open range, the cattle boom is going to stay, but the open range is going to end. So by the 1880s, it's going to start decreasing in demand because the long trail drives became really like ineffective in terms of cost. Um, they became very expensive and the cattle would lose weight so they were not as profitable by the time they got up north. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to West Texas, but West Texas is not booming in water sources. And so most of these cattle drives would have to bring large amounts of water with them on their way up north. Um, then you are going to have the creation of barbed wire, which there are examples of in the pictures. And barbed wire is going to end the open range. For the first time, farmers are, or ranchers are going to be able to fence off their land. And there's not going to be any of this mixing of cattle anymore. And so this whole idea of the open range of just being able to roam is really going to end. Um, so you also are going to have the development of the windmill. So as I said in the last slide, there's a hard time with getting water sources to West Texas. So the development of the windmill is going to help this. So if you've ever seen the windmill, it's the thing that has the spikes at the top and it spins. Um, so what that does is it serves as a pump and so there's pipes that go down into the ground and as it spins it kind of forms this siphoning motion and it allows water to come up. Um, so this is really going to change the West in terms of the cattle industry. So here's the big thing about the cattle industry you need to know. Texas had a lot of cattle because of the Spaniards and they were left unchecked for hundreds of years almost. This is going to allow Texas to bring in businessmen who are going to develop ranches who are then going to sell their cattle up north. However, 
the invention of barbed wire is going to end this open range and it's going to cause private ranches to be set up versus ranches working together. Um, if you know those things, you're good in terms of understanding the cattle industry in the West. Um, the cattle industry is still in existence today. Texas is still the number one producer of cattle in the United States. So this is something that is still relevant to our lives today. Next time you go to the grocery store and you buy some beef with your parents, it is most likely Texas beef. All right. Well, hello, cowboy. So this is going to be where cowboys get started. The whole legends of um, Pecos Bill is going to come from Texas. So how did the cowboys get started? So these were traditions in, of the Spanish vaquero, and then in Texas, specifically the Tejano. The Americans are going to adopt their way of life and their way of dress in terms of cattle ranching. So cowboys are interesting because they're going to come from a diversity of backgrounds. So they are going to be made up of Tejanos, whites, but also you're going to find that African Americans are going to find themselves participating in cowboy activities and especially working on the ranches. You're also going to have native Indians. You're going to have Mexican citizens who are going to migrate into Texas. And then you're going to have people moving from the Eastern United States to come try their hand at making a fortune in the cattle industry. Many of the cowboys were former soldiers from the Civil War, and many of them were former slaves. And then you're also going to have some women actually become cowgirls. So it was not just men. Um, cowboys worked long hours caring for the cattle and horses. They repaired fences, buildings. They conducted the cattle drives. Work of the cowboy involves using a lasso far more than a gun. And they faced a lot of hazards, especially when they were on the cattle trail. They were in danger of experiencing stampedes. And then they had to deal with extreme weather conditions. Because in Texas, I don't know, over where we live in Houston, our weather can be four different seasons in one day. Well, West Texas has its own extreme weather conditions as well. Um, side note, if you look right here, because I just noticed this mistake. So if you look right here on the word slaves, I accidentally included an R right there. It should not be slavers. That is slaves. So get rid of that R right there if you are taking notes, which I hope you are. All right, the Indian Wars. So this was the name used to describe a series of conflicts between the federal government and native Indians. You should have already learned about Manifest Destiny and westward expansion. So Manifest Destiny was the idea that the United States was destined by God to spread from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And to do this, they had to take that land. And if there were Indians laying on that land, well, then there were Indians on that land. Um, and they had to take it. So this is going to cause wars because rightfully so, the Indians did not want to give up their land. So this is going to cause some issues. The United States government is going to take that land. Um, if they have to use force, they're going to use force. And they're going to try to sign treaties with the different Indian nations in order to find solutions that are nonviolent in taking this land. So in Texas and throughout the West United States, we had Buffalo Soldiers. There is a fantastic Buffalo Soldier Museum in Houston. Take some time, go down there this summer, ask your parents to take you. It is a great museum. So Buffalo Soldiers, were African American soldiers who were in the 9th and 10th Cavalry, as well as the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments that were stationed in Texas. 
They were former slaves who had fought for the federal government during the Indian Wars. They received the name Buffalo Soldier because of their bravery. This was given to them by the Indians that they fought against. And the cool thing about the Buffalo Soldiers is for many former slaves, this was a chance for them to be treated with respect and treated as if they were equal. Um, it was a huge honor to be a Buffalo Soldier, and especially in the West. All right, so the last Comanche chief in Texas. So the Comanche tribe was one of the big tribes in Texas. Um, probably the biggest. They are going to be the ones who master the use of horses, and they're really going to cause problems for the government. So their last chief, his name was Quanah Parker. His mother, who is in this picture right here that I just highlighted. So this is his mother holding him as a child. Um, she was a white woman. Her name was Cynthia Ann Parker. And she had been kidnapped by the Comanche as a child and raised by the tribe. She is going to marry Quana's father, Chief Pita Nakona. And they're going to have Quana, who is going to grow up to become chief of the Comanches. Um, he is going to fight tooth and nail against the Texas military, Texas Rangers, and the federal government for the rights of the Comanches. However, he does eventually surrender to the U.S. Cavalry, and he is going to assimilate into American culture. So if you look at the pictures on the right, this is after he is assimilated, where the pictures on the left are of him during his time on the run from the U.S. government. So after he assimilates and takes on American culture, he is going to encourage other Indians to do the same. All right, the arrival of the railroads in Texas. So railroads were built across Texas to help transport goods like cotton, cattle, and lumber. East Texas is known for lumber. Um, and they're, the railroads are going to move these products up north. Railroads, once they hit, arrive in Texas, are going to instantly increase and strengthen the Texas economy. As businessmen and farmers are now able to sell their products across the country, Texas and all of its natural resources are going to become in high demand. So one of the most influential pe people in all of Texas history was Governor James Hogg. If you look up James Hogg on Google, it's going to come up with a poet. So you might want to search him up as Jim Hogg if you are going to take that extra step to Google him. Um, I put a picture of his daughter on the right hand side. So I just highlighted her picture for you. Her name was Ima. Yes, he named his daughter Ima Hogg. Let that sink in. I'm a hog. However, I'm a hog is going to be very important as she is going to spend her father's fortune in developing the arts within Houston. Um, so you are likely to see her name when you are in downtown Houston. She is responsible for the Houston Symphony. Um, but let's get back to her father, because in this story, he is by far the most important. So he was the attorney general and then eventually became the governor. The attorney general, if you did not know, is the highest attorney, so the most powerful attorney in the state of Texas. Um, so he is going to work to reform big business, and he is going to try to protect the average citizens of Texas from unjust business practices. He supported the creation of the Texas Railroad Commission that protected citizens from unfair practices by the railroads. In fact, today, the Texas Railroad Commission is one of the most powerful offices in Texas. Um, so Governor Hogg was really concerned about the people of Texas, making sure that people in Texas were not taken advantage of and were treated correctly. All right, so let's talk about the agricultural impact of cattle and cotton and railroads on Texas. 
So your political impact, you're going to have more money for the state. The state has more money. That's money that they can use to help the citizens of Texas. You're going to have economic impact in the fact that products were now able to be moved and sold across the nation. New cash crops are going to be produced here. So things like wheat and sorghum, you know, sugar is huge. Sugar land, it's named for sugar. Cotton and corn are going to be grown across the state. This is going to affect inflation and income from agriculture is going to be exceeded by um, cattle ranching. So they go back and forth right after the Civil War. Cotton and agriculture is going to bring in more money. Then cattle is going to bring in more money. And then at the turn of the century, farming and cash crops are going to trump ranching in terms of income bringing into the state. Your social impact. Farmers are going to move west. You're going to have new methods of farming developed, irrigation, terraces, and you're going to see the increase of sharecropping in tenant farmers, which is going to result in many people being in deep debt to the landowners. So, like I said, slavery in itself may be over, but the equitable treatment of now free blacks and poor whites are not going to be there. They are still going to be in great debt and almost in a way not owned but not fully free as they are tied to their land through the debts that they owe the owner. And then the impact on the western frontier. So this is West Texas. So your political impact. Because of barbed wire, you're going to have what's called as range wars. So these are basically farmers and ranchers are going to be battling each other. They are going to be cutting and destroying fences. They're going to burn pasture land. This is going to cause gunfights. It's going to lower property values. And eventually the Texas government is going to have to step in and say that fence cutting is a felony and you could be imprisoned for cutting somebody else's fence. Then you have the economic impact. So you have the expansion of the railroad. Cattle ranching becomes business rather than a way of life. You're going to have the growth of large ranches. So like King's Ranch is going to be the dominant ranch in Texas. You're going to have new inventions such as barbed wire and the windmill. We're going to start, we're going to start breeding and raising sheep. And then there's going to be improvements in our quality of beef. And then finally, the social impact is the growth of population in towns in West Texas. Up until this point, nobody really lived in West Texas other than the Indians. Now you're going to have Anglos and Hispanics really filling in West Texas, you know, towns like El Paso and Fort Stockton and Lubbock and Odessa. You're really going to see an increase of people moving into these towns. So this is what you need to know to understand the major impacts of this era. I know is a lot. This is kind of just the rough notes of this era. So please, if you need to rewind, go back, watch something. If you have any questions, email your teacher. Anything you need, let us know. We are here to help you. Um, like I said, rewind rewatch, take notes, split it up into segments, whatever you need to do to help you. And I hope you enjoyed this era of Texas. I personally love it. I think it's influential in determining who Texas is today. And it's a great, great time of history to learn about. So um, I hope you enjoyed it and have a great day.